Human potential. Has it been reached? No. Can we push our meat suits further? Absolutely we can. On average, every day, you only access roughly 30 to 50% of your strength and stamina due to limiting mechanisms within the brain that stop us from damaging ourselves due to exertion. Of that accessible strength, say things like when we go to the gym, if you lack mental fortitude, your brain will get tired long before your body does. What about in other areas? How about lifespan, for instance? Once upon a time, we assumed largely that those that lived to 60 were an anomaly, and the average age of demise was around your late 30s, early 40s, and if you go even even further back in time, it was earlier than that. So obviously, there is room for improvement concerning our body's function, undergoing mitosis, combating diseases, recovering from exertion, and in general, our life can get more efficient. To solve these issues, a small group of doctors within Australia devised a test that would be used on an unsuspecting neighborhood as well as their own employees to begin using a mystery supplement that would affect the cells of people, unlocking their true potential. However, you saw the title of this video, and it has the word body melt in it, and that's exactly what what would happen to those that were actually lucky. Others would fare much worse. So today we'll be discussing what exactly happened, what is this mystery supplement, and what would ultimately happen to the human form when exposed to this Vimuville dietary supplement. So you know the drill at this point. Up on screen you'll see a timestamp. Head there if you want to bypass this movie, but I will say it's from the tail end of 1993, so even the clothing alone is worth watching the summary for. For those of you that do stay, I gotta tell you, this is one of the weirdest movies I have ever seen in my life. I'm actually a little concerned concerned about Australia as a whole. Should we be like checking up on them for their mental well-being? Then again, it's 40 degrees Celsius and everything there is trying to take them out. So I guess that would probably artistically influence me as well. Anyways, let's get to it. We open up with a few doctors getting frisky. I've learned recently that you got to censor everything for this platform. So sorry about that. Y'all can't see the goods. But while the guy lays on the couch, apparently on something, the female doctor who also heads distribution and sales branch for this concoction injects him with a liquid. Her words state that this is enough to put down about 20 rabid Rottweilers, so he won't make it till morning. The man eventually gets up and leaves the office after pulling information on where the test subjects are living. Upon doing so, he exits the facility, then burns his ID cards to erase all evidence of him being an employee there, because, I mean, come on, it's 1993, it's not like computer files were really that reliable back then, I think. Anyways, he gets in his car and then sets off to warn those unwilling participants of what has arrived in their mailboxes. Getting to the actual town of Holmesville, a Melbourne sub, he stops at a gas station to go inside and get detergent, of all things. This will be discussed later as to why he did this, but after chugging the detergent, this isn't an ideal situation, and he exits the gas station and gets shakily into his car. Wounds begin to open up on his neck as he is pursued by officers for his crazy driving that he is doing. He makes it to the actual neighborhood, where he would ultimately meet his end via tentacles that have formed within his thoracic cavity, and it appears as though they have moved up through the trachea and out of the mouth. So the whole detergent thing was actually, if you didn't know, the reason the Tide Pod Challenge was stupid and entirely dangerous, is something that is that basic can actually just straight up melt your cells. So he was essentially trying to keep the tentacles at bay by melting them. But anyways, uh, they end up just choking him before he can warn anybody what's in their mailbox, and the test continues as planned. As the cops rope off the area, the neighborhood begins its day after people getting an eyeful of the dude out front. One man opens up a free packet of Vimuville and pours it into a glass and then drinks it. Fast forward, things aren't looking so hot for Paul. Oh, and I think I should mention this before going forward. Imagine this movie is a lot like VHS, if you've seen that. There's an overarching plot with many subplots scattered throughout, kind of shows the effects of the vitamins, which is fantastic because it gives us evidence as to what it's actually doing. Okay, so anyways, Paul heads out to the airport for reasons where clearly he seems to be off his A-game. Two teens in front of him assume that he's on something as he continues to zone out, and he looks over at a woman. As he does, a beam of light envelops her. Later, as he drinks his coffee, a disfigured woman sits across from him, at least that's what he sees, and then she begins to talk about how it rains too much in Sydney. She says she needs a place to stay, and then he obliges as she disappears. While this is happening, the two college students known as Sal and Gino are heading to a resort where they are promised to get paid for certain donations. Pretty pumped about the idea, they take off in the car after having presumably taken the vitamins as well. While driving, however, they would ultimately have their windshield broken off camera. As a result, they are forced to pull over at a conveniently placed mechanic who literally has a sign up for replacing windshields. They pull off into his shop and immediately begin to show signs of mental alteration. The mechanic there, with his two sons and daughter, all appear to be a little off. The mechanic himself sporting some sort of growth on the side of his face, and his children appearing quite inbred or perhaps possessing genetic deficiencies, though I will probably say it's inbred, as the mechanic mentions to his daughter to keep it in the family later. Mmm, gross. Anyhow, the two young men instantly strike up a seemingly personal friendship out of nowhere with these two inbred sons and decide to hang out with them while their windshield is getting fixed. Meanwhile, in Melbourne, Paul is beginning to largely feel the effects that something is off within his body. He ends up falling asleep on 
the couch in his office and then is awoken by his assistant who tells him to go home. Paul appears not to know how he got there at this point. Arriving back home, the hallucinations continued. The disfigured woman appears in the hallway and he points to the guest bedroom and says that she can sleep there. Again, this would have just been kind of like a complacency thing only brought on by the effects of this vitamin and its mental alterations. Shortly after, he lays down to go to bed and she appears, except this time she is no longer disfigured. Instead, she begins massaging his stomach and just before reaching in and grabbing his guts, he awakens covered in sweat, clearly showing it was a dream. Back across on the way down under with the college age students, the four boys end up taking out a kangaroo with a rock, which I'm pretty sure is borderline treason in Australia. That's a bloody outrage it is! However, upon doing so, rather than the normal reaction of kind of contemplating the senseless demise of a creature, they all cheer. Again, this also points to them having consumed the vitamin as their brains are becoming affected. The two inbred sons take out the adrenal gland and then split it, which I do have to point this out. That's the neck. I'm not really sure what kind of kangaroo has its adrenal gland in its neck. So here's where the most prominent mental impairment is displayed. The shorter of the two college students runs off with the daughter into the shed. While in there, she uh, just kind of continually stabs him in the junk and eventually bites his neck, causing him to meet his end, while the other just runs and hides. He attempts to steal a truck and then make his escape, but the steering is all jacked up and it can only turn right. Probably a pretty good indication considering the circle of dirt. He eventually just hits a tree and the family moves in to finish the job on him as well. At this point, the cops have begun to get involved and two detectives have begun to become suspicious at the health club after finding some clues that pointed back to them. After interviewing the lead of distribution, they determine that there's not really enough to go off of and continue on to where the tentacle man is being held. While looking at him, they find that the cells of his stomach have become degraded and that the tentacles grew from nowhere. His official cause of demise was deemed hypernatural. Moving back to Paul, things aren't so hot at this point for him either. His hallucinations are becoming more and more stout. After looking into his mailbox, he has a minor freak out moment where he sees the same woman that is apparently living in his house, but she's not actually there. Eventually, as he lays in his bed, she mentions how she's chosen 11 men before him to take their ribs and that she is going to take his and then just straight up massages his rib out of his chest. But considering this is a hallucination, this would probably just indicate he pulled his rib out of his chest. While Paul is going boneless across the road, the Noble family gets a Vimuville flyer and a letter stating that they have been invited to come on vacation at their health resort. Moving on, there's a couple expecting a child relatively soon next door to the Noble family. After going for a checkup, they make sure that everything's okay for a routine check-in with the doctor. It is revealed that the doctor is in league with the woman who runs the distribution center and that this may actually be entirely his project or so we are led to think. This is likely when he gave the pregnant woman the dietary supplement which she took without thinking. After the appointment, Dr. Carrera as he is known receives a call from the distribution manager as she has lined up many stores for the supplement. However, the doctor wants to go back to testing because the supplement isn't behaving as it should, stating that it didn't take out the employee from the beginning quick enough and that it was having no effect or erratic effects on others. They didn't know how it would behave and it could ultimately attract the attention of the cops, which it already has. Later that night, the pregnant woman gets up to get a glass of water and finds that her stomach isn't making the usual noises it always does. Stacking it up to maybe just indigestion or growth of the baby, she chooses to ignore it, but something much more sinister is happening within her. She gets up the next morning and sees that the Noble family is leaving out for a trip to the health resort. They leave and then she heads back inside. After going back inside, her stomach begins to heave and causes her great distress. Eventually, just straight up a placenta is dropped onto the ground and it's essentially sentient so it slinks away. She calls the doctor asking if it's normal for a month before the baby is due for the placenta to drop, which tips him off that he probably needs to go check on her. She tries to find it to no avail as her stomach continues to shift and change shape. She goes onto the bed and then grabs a knife to cut open her belly to stop the pain as her husband comes in. He tries to stop her but then is attacked by the placenta facehugger style. After sliding down his throat, it resides within his stomach and it is revealed that the pregnant woman's baby has turned to a gas within her and then blew open her stomach, ending her in the process. The husband is then arrested for being sus and taken to the police station. The detectives question the doctor after he arrived, asking him if he knew anyone else in the area or if she was on any supplements, and he denies obviously, but the detectives are beginning to become a little suspicious of the doctor. While in the neighborhood, after the cops leave, the doctor realizes that he must cover his tracks and Paul is still infected. He enters Paul's home with a vial of what appears to be a tranquilizer and approaches him. When Paul turns around, his face is mostly melted and his eyes are bulging. Paul then grabs the doctor and begins ripping his ear off. In the scuffle, the doctor leaves behind his vial and syringe. After the health club, the family has arrived and then heads inside. They are met with a largely empty building but like a ton of food on the table. They all sit down and begin eating, not knowing that there is a supplement in it. As they eat, the dad is the first to show signs as his mucous membranes begin producing a ton of snot, which is pretty nasty. It is shown after the snot begins to move as well, indicating that the cells have become sentient within him. So I'm not gonna lie, this place does look pretty boring and the kids agree. While the daughter and son bicker about it, the son decides that he will head out to the half pipe to go 
skating and then camp outside. As he does, his own mental impairment takes over and he goes for a jump and messes up the landing slamming his face into the half pipe. His family assuming he's just out camping doesn't bother to check on him and it can be seen that the vitamin supplement has begun melting his face in the night as he meets his end. Oh yeah, this movie really isn't that shy about taking out kids. Back at the health club, things aren't going too well. The entire employee staff has hopped up on these things. The main distribution manager is seen popping them like candy and is becoming increasingly unfocused. The two jacked employees are also on them and begin to suffer ill effects. The first one, upon watching some um, stimulating videos, literally has his gear explode. Then the other is getting frisky with the female employee and he ends up having a muscle seize and ends the female employee and then has his own back split open near the spine, ending him. So while the health club is becoming more and more unhealthy by the minute, back in the mechanics after disposing of the two college kids, the doctor arrives to talk to his old business partner. Apparently the mechanic worked with the doctor back in the day and developed this supplement. However, after the apparent takeover by Dr. Carrera, he swiped the stabilizing blend he created. Without it, the supplement will ransack the body and the body can't handle its newfound potential. Realizing everyone who is infected will meet their end, the doctor then tries to cover his tracks, but it is too late. The dad is the first to go in the novel family, well, apart from the son. He ends up producing like a ton of mucus and then slips and hits his head. As he lays there, more mucus begins bubbling up out of his mouth when his wife finds him. So she freaks out and runs off to find the daughter. The daughter is trying to figure out what's happening and then runs to the distribution manager who is currently literally melting. She tries to slap some sense into her, but it causes her head to implode shortly after contact. Completely forgetting about the son, the mom and daughter take off to find another doctor up the road in town. After arriving, the doctor asks them what they were doing at the chemical plant that's been shut down for years. After the realization that chemicals were pumped into them, the mom begins to suffer an attack at this point. As the doctors ask what's wrong, her tongue begins to grow at an alarming rate until it eventually fills up her entire mouth and then hangs out the front. As you could probably imagine, this would actually cause her to suffocate by shutting off the airway. The detectives at this point arrive and then see the doctor brandishing a handheld in the parking lot. He has apparently lost it at this point and then fires a projectile into his hand and then eventually his head. With nobody to take back to the police station, they just shut down the plant and then head back home. When they arrive, Mr. Placenta Man is still there and now is fully infected. The supplement having festered in his stomach has caused him to throw up on almost every cop there before finally succumbing to the internal injuries brought on by this supplement. All seems to be over, but it's not actually done. As the detective heads inside to get aspirin for the other, a panning shot shows that some of the supplements did make it out into the general public and are sitting on the shelves waiting to be bought. Alright, so the question on everyone's mind. What in the name of all that is holy is this stuff? Well, it's marketed as a dietary supplement and really it's said that it's a vitamin. However, A, it was produced in a previously shut down chemical plant, which is strange for vitamins to be created that way. And B, to my knowledge, no vitamin in the quantity shown and what these people were taking, whether to be a pill or powder, would cause the body to slough away like that. No, what it actually appears to be is something else entirely. When the doctor was questioned about what may be going on or if there were any diseases that cause anyone to hallucinate, the first thing he mentions is a virus. Many viruses can affect the brain by inducing something known as meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation within the meninges which protect the brain and surround it in the inside of the skull. What happens is after the immune system is activated, these will inflame and this can induce coma, aggression, visual and auditory disturbances. Basically any of the senses that report to the brain, which is all of the senses, can then be altered by the brain itself due to pressure from the meninges pressing on the skull and then putting back pressure on the brain. So the first thing that we can establish is that some sort of immune response appears to be happening. Whether it's the overproduction of mucus from the father, the fatigue in Paul, as well as the visual and auditory hallucinations he suffered when seeing the woman that wasn't even there, or even the distribution manager who began to suffer from double vision when looking at her screen. The time frame also seems to support that the immune system has been activated. As stated by the employees at the beginning before meeting his Rule 34 demise, phase one is hallucinations. That's already been equated to possibly a sort of cytokine storm or inflammatory response to the invader in the brain, resulting in changes to the neurological activity of the brain. The second phase is discussed as being glandular and this can only bring us to what is actually invading. In your body, you have the lymphatic system, a system of glands used to store and house T cells and B cells to combat foreign invasive organisms should the innate system be overwhelmed. Well, judging by what we see to those that stay alive the longest, clearly they are combating what appears to be a virus. Their lymphatic system is activated and the immune system begins to attack the invasive species. This may be why the third phase is just an all-out dissolving of the body, and here's why. As cells were invaded by the virus disguised as a proprietary blend of supplements, the cells would be infected and invaded. After catching wind, the immune system would then begin ordering cells that were infected to undergo apoptosis. And for those that don't know, apoptosis is programmed cell death. As the body degrades, it appears that this virus may also be within the neurons of a person or even possibly producing enzymes to stop temperature increase resulting in 
fever. So it does not appear as though there's a fever in most of them. So the people may be kind of lethargic like Paul was, but have no fever until the later form arrives, which is why he would wake up sweating. But again, we don't really see it in any others, except for maybe the father of the noble family when he looked pretty sick before meeting his end. However, I don't believe it to be just apoptosis affecting these cells leading to the degradation of the meat suit. Taking a look at any of the matter that leaves the body, it appears to move independently. Now, obviously this is pretty strange, but in the natural world, this can be common. Maybe not at the speed of say the mucus in the sink, which is nasty, but a protozoa is a eukaryotic cell that can propel themselves through environments. And usually that's aquatic environments. Regardless, after the body is infected with this virus without the inhibitor that the mechanic swiped when he left, it appears that the virus either goes haywire within the body and changes due to the immune system pressure, or it happens at a deeper level and the inhibitor stops the rewriting of genetic coding within the person and preserves genes, whereas without the inhibitor, it ends up destroying these crucial genes. If it's the former over the latter, this would kind of explain the melting of people as cells are just in mass quantities destroyed by the body. But if it is the latter, this is kind of my thinking with it. Multicellular organisms play well together on a cellular level because everyone wins. Safety, warmth, nutrients, you're stronger together than apart. And over time, cells have gotten on board to create animals, trees, fungus, you name it. Anything that's multicellular obviously possesses many cells. Now, this isn't just a choice, but a carefully crafted set of genes that allow for the coexistence and signaling and communication with cells. When something doesn't play by the rules, we call this cancer. In our bodies, cancer is basically just a biological douche that stays in and uses resources, but doesn't want to play by the body's rules. So medicine or immune system intervention is needed to destroy the cancer by force. With normal cells, apoptosis can be ordered and the cell will self-destruct, which keeps everything working and running smoothly. The virus would likely destroy these genes or rewrite them. As a result, the cells no longer want to play together and instead it becomes every cell for itself or at minimum, that's what it appears like. This would explain the apparent degradation of the stomach tissue and the formation of tentacles as these cells bonded together in different structures than the structures they originally were in that worked for the body. This would also show why the infant was melted down so quickly as these cells noped out and completely split up. Another reason to suspect this is a virus and not just a supplement issue is transference. Now usually when you take a vitamin, you can't just like have it go to the next person like if you kiss them or inadvertently bleed on them. It's not an infectious virus. It, I mean, it, that's not how it works. But you know what can jump between people? Viruses. And this is why at the end the husband was fully transformed as he was essentially infected and the virus continued to run its courses melting him down. And the final reason to suspect a virus is timing. Those that are functional and living would appear to last days or the better part of a week before having their skin tap out and it decides to leave. However, remember the kid. Slamming your face in the half pipe likely took him out of the game at that exact moment. As such, no functional immune system was present, no antibody formation to the virus, no resistance. He ultimately was broken down extremely quickly for his exposure. So in summation, this virus is a fast acting, fast reproducing organism that likely was like kind of like a form of early genetic alterations to unlock human potential. The issue was, however, without the inhibitor, the genes continued to be altered until most cells were rendered on their own and left the collective organism, resulting in the end of the person and really just their complete meltdown.